So um, from our side, I would just like to welcome everybody and, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. And we hope that it's, it's beneficial to you. And we also, I, I think I know you all well enough and, and please at the end, um, we would like to make it a little bit interactive. And if you've got any questions for us, um, but we'll deal with that a little bit later down the line. And I would just like to, for those of you, I think most of you know Michael, but I'd just like to, to hand over to Michael, so our COO of Sassman Bank, um, just to say a few words to you. Hi everyone. Thank you for taking out your time and um, thank you for all your support over so many years. I think that uh, rentals or Sassman Rental Finance together with so many of you have seen difficult times in the past. You know, we were there in 2008 together and this, this business for us, for Sassfin, has been such a wonderful business over so long. And uh, I would say it's the core of what we do. And there's so much potential for this business into the future. And obviously there are major concerns about the outlook for the economy and specifically what that does for certain equipment types. And already many of our suppliers are are rebalancing their books to engage in supplying uh, medical equipment or other types of green equipment, etc. And we're all going to have to change the way in which we engage. As I would say, the, the fourth industrial revolution is fast-tracked. I think what lockdown globally is doing is it's fast-tracking um, this whole digital revolution. Um, and um, David you know, has done a lot of research together with his team and the Sassman Wealth team around what that means for investment markets and how that's informed our uh, investment portfolio management. But obviously that has a real bearing on the way we run businesses as well, not just in the way we think through our investment portfolios. And therefore I think that many of the insights that David might share will be useful in the way you might think about the economy at large and the way you think about any money that you've invested in markets but they'll also, I think, be useful in the way that you think through and the way we think through how we structure our businesses going forward. Just to say that in response to the uh, corona as it entered our shores, we've done pretty well assessment in ensuring that we can provide all our services and operations and products to clients over this time. We only have about 4% of our staff working from the SASFIN office. Of that half are cleaners and the other half are engaged in facilities. So the, the vast majority of our business is being run from people's homes today. I haven't gone into the office since the lockdown. I've been able to completely fulfill my role uh, remotely. And I think that's true of all of, just about all of our management, our salespeople, our operations teams, et cetera. We, we also are conscious of the fact that many companies are going through difficult times. And therefore, we're doing what we can to support those companies who we believe um, are going through some pressure in the short term, but will uh, have got a viable long-term uh, future. But for those companies who unfortunately won't be able to recover from this uh, prolonged lockdown and from the, 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 the huge impact of what's happening at the moment, they obviously we have to adopt together with you a conservative approach to granting credit. And I think it's a fine balance at a difficult time. On the one hand, we, 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 we want to support businesses. That's our whole purpose, is to support businesses' growth. But at the, on the other hand, you know, if we don't do that in a sustainable way, if we don't really apply our minds to how these businesses will be able to survive and thrive in, uh, in, 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 these, in these times and in the post lockdown or corona world, whenever that might be, um, then obviously we, we, we put you at risk, we put ourselves at risk, and that doesn't serve any purpose. So um, we've granted lots of payment holidays, as many of you might be aware. We also have continued to write new business. Thank you very much to all of you for generating new business for us at these very difficult times, and I can't imagine how challenging that must be for many of you in your businesses, especially because um, a lot of those weren't uh, classified as essential services under lockdown level five, and there are these heavy limitations under level four. 
and you spend so much time building businesses that it's very frustrating, I can imagine, as it is for us and so many of our clients to uh, be hamstrung at this time. But I think the real trick now is to evolutionize our businesses or revolutionize them to, to, to take uh, cognizance of the digital world that we're entering into in a much faster way. We've implemented uh, DocuSign and other measures, which I'm sure the team will take you through. And then to, um, to ensure financial strength and stability at these points, to preserve cash um, and to just retain strength, and then to make sure that we do whatever we can to support all our stakeholders, to pay our suppliers as quickly as possible, to look after our staff, to look after our, um, our clients. Um, and I think in doing all of that and really focusing on culture, um, what will happen is that we will emerge together in a much stronger way um, in the coming months um, as, as this uh, situation unfolds. So just a big thank you. A big thank you to the team for everything that they're doing. And um, a big thank you to David, who I'll just introduce for a minute. He doesn't really need an introduction. He was once called, I think, by the Financial Mail, SA's favorite stockbroker. Um, he's much more than a stockbroker. He's, got a, he's been building uh, a, a global investment management capability for Sassfin over the last decade, which has been hugely successful. And anyone who's listened to his advice in terms of taking money offshore in the way in which he's done it has really uh, benefited. And um, he's got deep insights into global trends where him and his team spend a lot of time. And we're very grateful for the fact that he's been on these, you know, he normally has many speaking engagements a week. I, th I think with lockdown, he's probably doubled that workload. So David, a big thank you to you. And I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm not gonna pause for questions. If anyone wants to raise questions at any point, I encourage you to put those up on the chat um, and we'll try and address those as and when. I might leave the call for a bit, but then I might come back on. But on that note, I will hand over to David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Um, the nice thing about engagements is uh, you don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to find parking. You don't have to wait around. You know, you literally turn on your computer and uh, you can talk. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure. It's it's very comfortable at home. I'm getting used to this. Not putting on a tie. Um, just walking around with um, you know walking around in tackies, sneakers, whatever it is. But just um, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to try and cover uh, what's happened in the last few days as well as where we are. When I gave this talk on on Tuesday, um, so much has happened since then. It's so it's such a dynamic situation, changing direction. It's like the weather. You know, every 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 hour it, it shifts, and uh, one has to keep up with where it is. As Michael said, we manage money, and my main focus at the moment is where to position ourselves and how to look ahead. Of course, always remember we as as fund managers are are looking five years ahead. You know, we're positioning ourselves for what's likely to happen in the next three, four, five years. You know, it's of course we're concerned with where where we are in the short term, but uh, we're trying to work out how this will affect us down the line. The big discussion at the moment, of course, globally is, do you continue with the lockdown or do we open up their economy as well? And no one has the answer. Absolutely no one has it. You know, scientists have the information and it's, of course, policymakers that have to actually then make the big decisions. It, it, it's not for scientists to make the decision. And uh, one of the problems is that you have no perfect information. You know, the information is so imperfect that politicians are struggling with it. And w straight after I gave this presentation on Tuesday to other clients, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci and other members of uh, Trump's medical team actually uh, were in front of the Senate, were, um, you know, being asked offline, of course, or online, sorry, rather than that, uh, there was a Senate interview as to, as to uh, how they saw things. And Fauci came out, obviously saying that if they unlocked the economy, which on which, you know, Trump was giving a lot of pressure, if they unlocked it, 
uh, there would the, you know the, the whole situation would become uncontrollable. That's the word he used, uncontrollable. Um, and the virus would spread and it would set the economy back. Now this is not what Trump wanted to hear. And even now, you know, over the last day or so, you've been you know he's been uh, tweeting. Uh, against Fauci as well. And Fauci says, I'm a scientist. That's how I see it and that. But it does make things very difficult for him. And I think Graham Poser is in the same kind of situation. He only came up because there's been a lot of pressure on him to talk. I don't think he's got any you know, way through this. I don't think they know what to do. They're completely confused. And I'm, I'm saying as a politician, um, it's not their fault. They've never had to deal with a situation like this. Medical people are giving, uh, medical people are giving advice on the one hand, and you've got the, um, the, the business community and economists on the other hand. And he has to find a middle path and say, what is best? Uh, for everybody, where do we go? And that's why for 35 minutes last night, he spoke about literally nothing. And I'm not criticizing, you know, I'm just saying nothing came out of it. Just simply, he doesn't know. The only time we're going to get um, the only time things are going to be a cl lot clearer is when we find a vaccine and when uh, or we have some kind of treatment for this. Uh, for the virus and everybody feels comfortable enough to go back to work or to. Um, to travel, to meet friends, to go to restaurants and so on, and to get our lives back to normal. Um, but until then, I think progress on the economic side is going to be slow. Now, the good news is that, that I think somewhere on, along the line, there will be a solution. You know, every few minutes, something's popping up uh, around a vaccine or around a cure or around antibodies and that. Um, but I think what we do know is that the longer we keep our economies locked, the more trouble it's going to be, or the more troublesome it's going to be to get out of this. Um, and, and, and that's a worry. And listening to Jay Powell, uh, who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, I was actually listening to his speech yes, yesterday. And as he started to speak, he started to get that uh, worried feeling because you knew where he was. Just the body language was so different from other talks that he's uh, that he's given. And what he said, and and and, and it was very worrying. Uh, you know, he said that um, the pace at which we've seen this economic destruction is something that they've never had to handle before. Um, this was. You know, you know, this was very, very difficult for them to, to grasp. And what he, what he actually said in question time afterwards, he said, you know, over the last decade of coming out of the 08, 09, um, coming out of that 08, 09 crisis, he said, it had taken them a decade to get to where they were. And if one remembers in February, the US economy created 200,000 new jobs. 200,000, and unemployment was down at historically low levels, 3.5%. That was at the end of February. The end of March, we lost 700,000 jobs. Uh, oh, sorry, the US did. And at the end of April, 20 million. So in one month or in a period of like six weeks or on, whatever, however many jobs have been created had been lost. And for him, it was a very disturbing in a sign. I know that we're going to get out of it and hopefully jobs will come back fast. But he was, he was particularly worried about it. what he said is that the people who are losing their jobs, and this applies to South Africa as well, you know, whatever I'm saying for, um, for the US is symptomatic of South Africa as well. He said, for the, the people who are losing their jobs are the ones who can least afford it. 40%, uh, sorry, of the people earning $40,000 or less, or in that category, 40% have lost their jobs. So it's a mammoth amount of people, and those are the ones that, um, that actually need it most. But I think what concerned him is that, yes, the Fed is always there, but his, his, his concern was, as, as I introduced as it said, the longer this takes, the deeper the recession is, the more difficult it is. Um, productivity starts to fall. People start to uh, um, move out of the labor force. Pro um, the, the problem is that they start to lose their skills. You lose, you know, you lose the skills. You can't find those kind of workers anymore as well. And, and I think the final message that he made was, was really pointed at um, Trump and the administration, the US. He said, 
you know, monet monetary policy alone can't do it. He didn't say it in those kind of words, but he said it's now up to the fiscus. It's now for fiscal measures to be introduced. And he said, no matter how costly, it'll be worth it. In other words, no matter how much it costs in the short term, it will be worth it. And, you know, that was his parting message. And that's, at the moment, you've got the Democrats and Republicans battling over this. And the pressure is now on Trump to actually put something in and do it fast. They can't afford to, uh, to fight and to be uh, partisan about, about where they are. So I think, I think that's, a, that's a very important situation um, a, a, as we are. And of course, in the long run, when you say it's going to be costly, it's going to be costly to taxpayers. So expect down the line a lot more pressure on, on tax. I think the one thing is, remember, we didn't, um, we didn't order this. Nobody ordered this. Uh, this, this, is no, this is not a usual um, depression or, rep sorry, recession. This, uh, this didn't come because of excesses or imbalances in the system. Uh, normally, when there's an imbalance, when there's overspending, as we saw in 08, 09, in the, in the, um, this was on the property side, um, measures were done to try and, and bring this down, to pop the bubble. This isn't the same kind of thing. This hasn't been brought. This is a health crisis uh, that's leading to an economic crisis. And no one was prepared for it. And my biggest gripe, which I'll come through to later, was that no government was positioned to actually handle uh, this pandemic. And um, the process now, and the thing that worries me as well, is that the government, in locking down the global economy, locking down their economies, have said, don't worry, we'll be there to bridge you. We'll be there to bridge you over this so that when things normalize, you'll be okay. Yes, there's going to be a lot of debt, but we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that. We're seeing a number of businesses that are going out of business, that are filing for bankruptcy. We see a huge number of people now on the streets having lost their jobs. And we're still trying to search for where that bridge is and, uh, you know, who's going to come to, um, you know, to their rescue. And that's the thing that worries me. As I said, we didn't order this. This was imposed upon us by government. Yet um, they're a little slow to actually find those kind of gaps. Um, and I think we're entitled, you know, we're certainly entitled to ask questions of government. You know, what are you doing to ensure that we get back to where we were when you, you know, before you impose these kind of lockdowns uh, on us. And I think the issues that we're seeing here apply equally to, uh, to countries around the world. I'll come to that in a, big, in, in, in a few seconds as well. But I think from a market point of view, we've seen quite a big recovery in the market. Uh, it's stalling now, but the big question is, can this continue? You know, if I look at the S&P, if I look at US markets, at one stage we were down, Oh, all about 30 odd percent uh, from the beginning of the year. Now we're down about nine or 10 percent. So there's been a huge recovery and um, a, a, a similar pattern in South Africa as well. There's been a big recovery from the lows that we saw uh, at the end of March and so April. There's been quite a fast recovery. And of course, the big question everybody asking is, uh, you know, will the market hold? Can we hold uh, as a result of that? And it's, 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 it's a very difficult situation and that the one thing that gives me a bit of encouragement, you know, even though we've recovered and the one thing I ask, everybody said this was the fastest bear market. I mean, markets fell within three, four weeks. They fell, uh, they fell 30%. So the fact that they've recovered, people are questioning the pace of recovery and is that justified and huge names, you know, very big names in the financial industry. Uh, globally, uh, Druckenmiller, Delio, um, what's the other one, Carl Bass, and so on, are asking, you know, are, are, are bemoaning the fact that the market's recovered and saying that it's, it's recovered too fast. Well, that's a good sign, because what it does say is that everybody who wants to be out is actually out. And I think that's one underpin to the market that we're seeing is that fund managers are particularly short of the market or underexposed, underweight equities, they're full of cash, uh, hedge funds are short. And in a way, that's a very good sign because that does mean that whoever wants to be out is, is, is actually out at the moment. I think the other good signs in the market is that um, we're seeing back to work in China, we're seeing, sorry, in Asia. 
a lot of nations are now starting to come back. They're a bit slow and tentative, and you can you can understand that. Um, my kids, my grandchildren in Australia have gone back to school, um, talking to the people in Zurich. Apparently, the schools have opened there. So things are slowly getting back over Labor Day in China. Um, People lined up to go to Disneyland. Yes, they had to wear masks, and yes, they wore gloves, and yes, their temperatures were taken, and uh, they were sprayed with sanitizer and so on. But things are happening. And there's good, uh, you know, the summer season, seem, booking seems to be picking up for the summer season uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. So we are starting to see a few signs that economic activity is um, is picking up. I think those are you know, two signs. The third sign is, as, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, huge amount of money is now being spent to find a vaccine, a massive amount. Um, companies like Sanofi are, are, are talking about breakthroughs, um, and it will go to the U.S. first because uh, I think they financed a lot of the vaccine, you know, the, a, lot, a lot of the investigations. Uh, we've seen Gilead, already their drug is which I think eases the, the, the pain or reduces the amount of time, uh, recovery time that's been shipped out. Um, I think Roche has come out with antibodies. So there are a whole lot of issues that are happening on the medical side that are, that are improving. Uh, you know, that's the third issue. And the fourth issue, um, as, as I spoke about with Jay Powell, governments are going to do or want to do, and central banks want to do as much as they can to, to get over this hump and spend. They do not want the global economy to go into a depression or into a major recession or a long-lasting recession for the issues that I mentioned uh, with Jay Powell. So I think those, those are the positive side. It seems gloomy at the moment, but I think we're probably at the worst level of, of the news as we are now. As economies unlock, slowly things are going to get better. So I suppose this Nader. This is the uh, the bottom of, of, of where we are. Um, I think some of the negatives, though, um, we still have to deal with uh, politics. And particularly in the US, you've got a, uh, a very um, under pressure President Trump, who with the economy falling and failing against him or falling against him, you know, he's, his whole, um, his whole, uh, um, Presidentship is, I don't know, that's a word, presidency, sorry, that's the word I was looking for, is based on the economy. And he's been bragging about the market, the stock market. Those are the big bragging points that, that he's made. And uh, he's under huge criticism as the economy comes un, under pressure, but also because of the way that they've handled the economy, uh, the, the crisis. So he's trying to, you know, he, he's trying to get out of this, get his popularity back. He's still under pressure. He's still uh, behind in the polls, but um, he's he's turning his blame on China now. He's turning. Uh, he's trying to punish them in in, in various way. Uh, wants to introduce tariffs again. Doesn't want government institutions to invest in China. You know, in Chinese stock market and so on. And this is all a fallback uh, in order to pick up his popularity. But it's not doing any good. I think if anything, it's 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 having the um, the the opposite effect. And, and certainly with China under pressure and with the U.S. economy in pressure, the last thing you want to do is start to engage um, in, in a trade war. But look at it, looking at the market, you know, moving away from the bad points, what have we learned from this and where are we going to gain? And the one thing that's come out has been the incredible contribution that technology has made um, to this crisis as well. It's coming through all the time in the various results. Yesterday, we saw Tencent's results. You know, Tencent, of course, um, and that's a company in which both NASPERS and Process have big stakes in that. And the results were staggering, way, way above where everybody thought they'd be gaming up in the region of about 31%. Um, I can't, I, you know, I can't name the games, but uh, Clash of Clans and the I, I don't know. You know, they're, they're, they're all very amusing for young people. I just find them very difficult to grasp. But nevertheless, a, um, a massive increase in, in, in uh, participation. Strangely, advertising and the way that people communicate. And uh, Tencent is not necessarily an e-commerce business. That's more Alibaba and that. But still, the amount of... Um, you know, the pickup in revenue is quite staggering. Now, that has filtered through to NASPERS and, and Process as well. Um, other companies like Netflix, Microsoft, Amazon, Spotify, Spotify, the music company, music streaming business. And what's very interesting is they're telling you what everybody else is listening to. And it's quite incredible to see, uh, you know, what 
um, how tastes uh, have changed, Alphabet, Facebook, and so on. These are businesses that have come out. Netflix, of course, has been the ultimate winner. Uh, when the results were out a few weeks ago, they would increased um, the number of subscribers significantly, way, way above where everybody was expecting them to be. And that's, that's translating the market. So even though markets are down and markets are under pressure, companies like Zoom, um, Zoom, which we're using at the moment, and everybody knows about, uh, up over a hundred, over a hundred percent. Netflix over thirty percent. Amazon up twenty-five percent. So remember, the market is down about nine or ten percent. So these shares are up by that kind of amount since the beginning. Activision Blizzard up about fifteen to twenty percent, which is a gaming company, rights games, Microsoft, AMD, and so on. So um, those companies have have gained significantly and are likely to continue to hold their place. Um, what what we want to point out. And what is evident is that these trends were already in place. It's not as though streaming, uh, Netflix, you know, streaming or gaming or um, working from home, um, they were all there before the crisis. What's happened is this has just reinforced and entrenched what is now going to be the way, or it's going to be an indication of the way that we live. Um, 5G is going to, you know, 5G, the cloud, where do we store all of this? Where do we store all that information that we are, uh, you know, the streaming information is on the cloud. Um, so I think this is, not, this is not going to be new and this is only going to increase. Our projections for the next five years for data usage is going to be quite significant. I mean, it's going to go up tenfold. So the cloud is not going to go away. Um, why are we talking about 5G? It just means that this is a tool for faster transmission. And uh, anything related to, to these areas are, are, are going to be the winners that come out of this. So the vi all that the virus has done has disrupted uh, the world economy or brought it forward, brought um, this a lot more, you know, a lot forward, uh, a lot more forward than it would have been in uh, in the normal course of the business, but it's not going to go away. Uh, other, there are other areas like, um, you know, that, that, that we're talking about that I can't really go into in a great detail simply because of time, but office automation is also going to be a big winner out of this, you know, rather than have staff have robots that actually process, um, you know, uh, process uh, your, your, your factory. Globalization is the big talk, talk, talking point as well, or the end of globalization, the introduction of localization, but that was already in place. You know, that was already, nobody wanted to rely on China. And with modern technology such as um, 3D printing, you could actually print parts in your backyard. You didn't have to have them made in China. So the shortening of those supply chains, again, is, is a talking point at the moment, but it was already in place. Um, I think that's one big disruption. The, big, the other big disruptor is, of course, going to be medicine and health. Um, I think what the virus exposed, and for me it's a, it's, it's a massive talking point, is how, how poorly prepared governments were. And there's not one country that has actually handled this better than the others. I know they, they, some of the Asian countries might have been better prepared, but um, overall nobody no one has got has been in a position to actually handle this. First of all, in terms of hospital beds, in terms of staffing, in terms of a plan to handle this. It's it just seems that the whole thing has been totally uncoordinated and uh, disjointed. Um, it's 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 quite unusual to see this happening. And I think also what's what's also quite evident is that there's been no coordinated effort by any country. One would have expected the United States to take over, as we've seen with other crises, where they take over the situation and, and bring bodies together so that there can be a world um, solution to this, or at least some kind of strategy to address it, where there's cooperation, where there's cooperation on the drugs, cooperation on the economic effects, um, you know, sharing views on unlocking and, and, and what they find not at all. And I think the blame probably goes to the United States, who's always been the leader. And if anything, I think that um, Trump has shown you, 
listen, we can blame Europe as well as closing the borders, not wanting anybody to come in and, and locking everybody else, not only physically, but not only uh, literally, but figuratively as well. Um, and the other thing is that we've seen weakened organisations like the World Health Organisation um, not being able to do anything. That's to an extent, it's been weakened over years through Trump's policies, not, you know, Trump's policies, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization. I see the head of the World Trade Organization has uh, resigned. He resigned yesterday, cutting short his contract simply because it's been such a difficult period. Trade wars have just uh, made it so difficult for him as well. But you've got climate, um, you know, climate change organizations are also are under pressure and so on. So I think the one thing that I think is going to come out of this because of the way that we've poorly handle is that I don't think the world population or the world voters are going to want this again. I think we're going to want to see a world that's coordinated or brought together again. I know Trump's a narcissist and he's on his own, he's in his own issues, you know, he's only worried about whether he gets re-elected or uh, again, that's all that, comp you know, that's all his mind is, is, is around. His anim administration acts slightly better than he does, but uh, it, it's quite pathetic to watch you know, where America is in this whole organization and all he's worried about is his ratings and so and so and people who accuse him of mishandling the, the, uh, the situation. So it's something we have to get, um, we have to get over and that. But I think what will come out of this and the other disruptor is going to be public health, public health and just the whole medical profession. I think um, no country is going to be in a situation where they're caught like this again, where they're not enough hospital beds, not enough equipment, um, where the population is not covered medically, where people can't go and have the best treatment, where there are not enough medical uh, scientists or staffs or nurses or doctors and so on. I think that's going to come out. A huge amount is going to be spent on public health. Testing has come out on the wrong side. Uh, hasn't hasn't really qualified or, or stood up to where it should be. Um, you know, to take seven days to test a case is 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 unacceptable. Uh, in this case, the one thing that you need to do is make sure that there's that there's fast or speedy testing and and that that also in, uh, you know prevents the spread. Um, you need the right kind of equipment and you need research into these kind of areas. The other one is pharmaceutical companies. There's been massive. Um, pressure on them to reduce the price of drugs. If you uh, reduce the price of drugs, you reduce their margins. If you reduce their margins, they have less money. If they have less money, less money for R&D. Um, and what it does is it points them or push, positions them um, to, do, to only look after the popular uh, diseases or look into the popular diseases, breast cancer, um, breast cancer, heart diseases, lung cancer, um, you know, what's a prostate cancer and so on. Um, so, so I think that um, there's going to be less, less pressure on pharmaceutical companies and more encouragement to actually open up and go for um, other, other, you know, look at other diseases as well. I think the other thing is sanitation. Um, that's going to change as well. Uh, big events, airports, the way we go through um, security at airports are now going to change now. Sanitation is going to be a very, very big area. Um, you know, the way that we go into buildings, I mean, toilets in buildings, toilets in, in malls, toilets in, you know, retail outlets, etc. Wherever people gather, I think there's going to be a much more emphasis on, uh, you know, on, on, on the way that we, on, on personal hygiene and uh, the state of those kind of issues as well. I think um, just on the health sector as well, it's also been one of the winners um, that is, um, you know, that is that has come out of this, and you've seen that health, uh, the price of shares in Gilead and Abbott and Biogen and J and J, Record and Ben Kaiser, who are Lysol and and Dettel as well, have also gone up, and uh, a lot more emphasis. So, tech and and tech and um, health are going to be the two winners, you know, that we're certainly looking at and um, down the way. Um, just just something else as well. I think that on the negative side. Um, and I'm coming to the end. I'm not going to be too long from here. I think just on the negative side, there is another disruptor, and that's been the oil price. You know, the oil price has fallen to levels uh, where uh, I think a month ago they were trading um, in, in negative territory. And I think what is, this has is exposed is it's broken down the cartel. 
Uh, we saw the same thing for those who are old enough. And remember, you saw the same thing in the diamond industry where there was a cartel that was just controlled by De Beers. It eventually broke down. And I think we're starting to see this, the breakdown of the cartel as well. The cartel, OPEC, does not have as much control as it, as it had. And that's also because a lot of productions come on from America as well. But I think we're going to see oil prices lower for longer. And there's quite an interesting comment that came out of this. So that's been a negative disruptor as well, which is very good for anybody who consumes oil. But Lord Brown, who's the former um, BP, uh, British Petroleum CEO, he said, the, you know, he said in an interview when discussing this, he said, you know, people who've spent months worrying about their lungs are more likely to want clean air. So because oil is down, you know, because oil prices down and become very cheap, it doesn't mean we're going to ignore alternative energy. And, and I think I'm going to end on, on, um, on, on, on this issue as well. Uh, the one thing that we're not going to ignore is, is clean air and the move to what is now to, uh, called ESG, which is um, environment, social, and governance. I still think it's going to be a big, you know, big issue in the lives of everybody you know, as we come out of this. That means, it doesn't mean that you're going to get ESG companies. You're going to get companies that actually um, tick the boxes. You know, tick the boxes of environment or um, climate change, pollution, waste. You know, are they adhering to those um, protocols? Uh, social. What's the workplace like? Is it safe? Is there, dis you know, is there discrimination, um, diversity, all those things? What, the board, what does the board look like? Governance, corruption, so, you know, um, business ethics and so on are still going to be a very important part of the lives. So I, I, I see coming out of this, you know, the three disruptors are going to be tech, medicine, and of course, ESG continuing. So I'm going to leave it there. I just, just Briefly on South Africa, where do we fit in? Uh, in in a very difficult situation. The reason is that the economy is already under quite a bit of pressure. But um, I think I think the big worry is the the debt that we're undertaking and how we're going to pay down the debt. It's going to be a headache. Um, it's it's going to be a very big challenge for us. And the only way out of the challenge, of course, is to, number one, to is austerity, you know, naturally, um, to become a lot more efficient. And I think South Africa has wasted billions and billions of rands through corruption and through various other issues like that. Um, and I think, I, you know, my own part, um, well, the one thing that irks me every year is, is, is how 80% of government departments uh, have qualified audit reports. In other words, not keeping proper books and records, to put it in simple terms. Um, for me, I think that, you know, if we do pull in our belts, if we do start monitoring this, we can save billions. And of course, the other one is growth. You know, without growth, uh, we're never going to get on this. And that's a that's a major imperative. It's very, very difficult for us at the moment while the world economy is under pressure. And also, you know, from a tourist point of view, it's one area that's always been at the forefront of, of growth. And without people traveling, that's that's an issue. But I think um, that's those are the areas that we have to focus on, of course, is austerity. And of course, on the other hand, picking up growth. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. I can't see your faces. I don't know whether you're still alive and still listening, but um, Michael. I hope you found... <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael. So we've got a couple of questions for you. It's Michael's David. I, I mean, sorry, David. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> David. Um, so, but before I start, it's a good thing that Sassman and our clients operate in our own economy. We need to know what's going on out there. But we run. Our, I always say we have our own economy. So. You're looking confused. <laughs> no, 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 no. We agree. Okay, so Mark wants to know. He said, "What is your view on the rand in the in, in the lat in in the at the end of the year, towards it if it remains at its current value, and okay. do you think this would have a positive effect on manufacturing?" You know, I, I look at the rand literally every few minutes of the day, <laughs> mainly because I keep my eye on the stock market, and the rand has a big bearing. And when we pull out of this, the rand will improve. When the global economy 
when we get out of lockdown, and I think it's going to be in the second half of the year, you'll start to see it in June, July, August, September. As things start to pick up and better news starts to come through, you know, that uh, employment is picking up and so on. And it's going to happen. Believe me, we're going to get out of this. This is not permanent. And it's going to come, you know, probably sooner than we think. As that happens, the RAND will start to improve. I think one of the positive things is that with bond rates where we are at the moment, huge amounts of money being coming in. And I think a lot of me, funny enough, a lot of money coming in to buy nice pairs and process. And that, that's why the RAND's been, you know, been picking up as well. We're about 1850 at the moment. But I promise you, I think that as the markets pick up and things get back to normal, we can go back to those 14, 15, where we were at the beginning of the year. Maybe not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for those kind of levels, but certainly a lot better than we are at the moment. So you'll watch that. Every time the markets pick up, the RAND improves. You know, when I say the markets, I'm talking global markets. The RAND starts to improve. People start to look at emerging markets. So I think watch that, you know, watch for those kind of uh, hints or, uh, you know, um, that, that kind of data. And watch where markets or global markets are going. You'll see the RAND improve. And Michael, it wasn't a question, but I, as you were talking, Why are you calling me Michael? We've got a, oh, sorry, David. <laughs> sorry. I've been speaking a lot to Michael today, so he's on top of my mind. We've got to put a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> But you ask cute. You ask cute, David. Some of our clients obviously import um, their, their, their equipment from overseas. So would you recommend for those who are the importers to take forward cover um, at this time when the RAND is so? Or I know I'm putting you on the spot and you can't no, give advice. But if I give an answer to that, you're going to lose customers. You know, that's okay. <laughs> you know it's, it's uh, forward cover is, is, are you saying is the RAND going to get worse? I don't think so. You know, yeah. I, I, I really, and, and, and again, please, um, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't use this advice, but I, I think that uh, short of a major calamity, a major outbreak in the United States, you know, of the virus, which sends us backwards and something like that, I think the news will start to get better. I think, as I said, we're at the bottom now. And and I, I think that the RAND will you know will improve. That also depends on us as well. We've what worst news can we have? We've we've been double you know we've, we've been downgraded. We've, everything's been thrown at us, uh, and yet we're holding where we are at the moment. So um, um, as as a as a backing person you know as a person in the market, I think if anything it, it's likely to get better. And this is going to be recorded, which could get me into serious trouble down the line. You know, when you look so back, Patrick has just said that the copier ind industry pricing has increased by 22% already. Sure. Because of the brand. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine that. And I think they're going to be quick to pass it on to you. You know, that's, uh, that's so sad. <laughs> you know, and then I've got just another question for you, David. <laughs> um, do you think that companies might move away from having and paying for large buildings in the future mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then having most staff working from home? I, absolutely. I think in a much more flexible way. I think that's going to be a trend. There's so many different trends that are going to take place. You know, it's hard to cover them all. That's definitely going to happen, um, that people are going to work. Um, you know, we've seen how effective it is. You can do it. And technology is improving at such... You know. If you have a look at this, um, and, and, and to explain why, um, I think the one thing is that when we had an event, um, we would, uh, you know, we would have to book out the hall, we'd have to have caterers, we'd have to do, you, you, you know what's around event, and it's lovely to have people around you. But you couldn't reach a wider audience. Admittedly, everybody's in lockdown, so we've got a captive audience whether they like it or not, and we might not get the same kind of crowds, and we might then have to move it to, to the evening. But just we had for one of our seminars, I mean, uh, one of the Sassman webinars, we had over 700 people. 
I mean, where are we ever going to do that? So I think those are the kind of changes that, that are going to take place. And it's so easy to do it. And it's such a minimum cost. So I think you can translate that into other areas as well, such as, well, if we can do this, you know, um, why do we need the office space if we can move effectively like this? You only have to meet once a week and go in and so on. So definitely, I think it's a, it's it's going to be, you know, it, it, it's going to have a big effect on on uh, letting, yeah. Okay, but the Sunderland team and our clients like parties. <laughs> That's you, yeah. For for you know, for people my age. Bed at seven o'clock. That's why I fell asleep during the speech last night. It was only what was a quarter past, not past eight. Gone, finished, sleep. Yeah. <laughs> but I agree with okay. you. You need that interaction. Yeah. You know, and the kids will tell you as well. The kids miss school. They want to go back to school. They want to be naughty in class. You know, they want to do those things. So don't think social interaction that we're never going to eat in restaurants again. That's nonsense. You know, but mm. I think from a business point of view, from a cost point of view, I think there are going to be a, a lot of ways that we um, you know, we look at things, you know, okay. the way we think differently. Thank you so much, David. Okay. <laughs> and we really appreciate your time. If well, any of you have got questions for David, you can just pop me an email and I can and run it past him. <laughs> but thank you. You can go have your lunch just now. Patrick, Patrick, I'm 72. <laughs> I'm long past the, he says, what's wrong with being 50? I said, I'm 72. I'm long past retirement age. I should have been put to pasture about seven or eight years ago. <laughs> still going on. <laughs> David, when I'm 72, I'm still going to be throwing the parties that Sunland uh, does. I'll be one of those little old ladies. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye. Bye. Um, so we're running. I hope. I hope if everyone's got time, because what we'll be able to do is um, continue a little bit, and if we don't finish, we can maybe organise another, because there's quite a bit we want to share. But just quickly before I hand over to Megan, I just want to um, ensure all of you that um, we are 100% fully operational. Um, we're there to support you through, through this difficult time because we always, I think at every party that I'm there with you, I tell you, we're there for you, we're gonna support you. Um, this is our time to prove it and to 100% to, to we're there for you. Our hearts, our team is fully operational. Um, when before Cyril even announced the 21 day lockdown, we we had 80% of our team working off site. So by the Thursday, when everyone was scrambling around, unfortunately I forgot to go to the bottle store. Um, so I'm happy for you to send me wine. It's okay. No, I'm teasing. Is that our team was 100% operational, and we know it's hard. And we know it's difficult, and we will be your partner through this difficult time. One, I, I was chatting to one of my clients the, the, this week, actually, and they said, well, Linda, what, what actually, it was a new client, what do you do? So the normal answer would be is that we do asset finance. But actually that's, and this has proved it to me even more, and why, and it's explained to me why, I love this industry so much and I love my clients so much is because you give us a purpose and our purpose is to enable the growth of your business and our purpose isn't to finance office automation or medical equipment or forklifts it's to ensure that your business can grow and the clients that you supply into their businesses can grow and as their businesses grow, they employ people. And if ever, ever our little country needed support and help and, and someone to get you through this difficult time, it's now. Because you just read those unemployment rates. And I mean, my heart breaks. I've only left the house to go shopping. And when I see the beggars on the side of the road and, and they people starving and people struggling and people who have lost their jobs, I, I get even I feel even more resilient to say what can what can I do? What can we do? So I just want to show we're fully operational. It is going to be tough. Um, once I've handed to Megan, I will talk a little bit about credits. Um, 
but just to show you whatever you need, what's, what, what's, what's within what we can do is that we are there to help you. We've got two products I want to talk to you about. Some of you might have heard about them, some of you might not. But if ever there was a time that these products could support you, and, and it can also be, um, well, the one can be an offering to some of your clients. The other one is specifically for you. But I'm going to hand over to Megan, uh, our COO, who will just take you through the two. And then I'll, I'll, after that, I will just chat a little bit about credit and a couple of other little initiatives. And can I just ask, um, can I just ask that we don't, believe it or not, <laughs> we don't know everything. So I would appreciate, and, and if that, if any of you have any ideas of what we could be doing different, any innovations, any, anything that, that you believe we could assist you with, um, we are trying to think out of the box, but we'd also appreciate a, a lot of you have been in the industry as long as I have. Um, and like Patrick says, what's wrong with being over 50? Um, I'm in the same boat, Patrick, but I started in this industry when I was 19. So it's been a long time and I, I'm still learning. And so let's, let's partner together. Let's work together. Let's, let's actually even forget about our competitor that we, we, we compete against each other. It's about how do we get our businesses, the companies and the people of South Africa through this difficult time. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Megan, who's just going to share two very exciting products with you. So Megan. Great, thanks Linda. Good afternoon everybody. As everyone has spoken about this afternoon, innovation is key and I think at times like this innovation is more key than ever before. It's sometimes difficult to think about what we have to do differently and how to innovate when all we're trying to do is put food on the tables and make sure we can pay our, our salaries. But as has been, we're really putting our heads down and trying to see what we could do. So with that, over the last couple of years, we've invested a lot of time and energy into our Beyond platform, which I believe a number of you have seen demo, demos and spoken to us about. And primarily what that has been around is transactional banking with invoice and payroll functionality. And one of the most recent developments that we've done is we've added a business revolving loan facility onto this platform. And the real purpose for this is to support SMEs, as we all know, SMEs is the growth fountain for our country, and we need to grow SMEs. So what we're doing with this is it's primarily targeted at um, companies that have been in business for three years and have an annual turnover of greater than two million rand. And how it would work is you could contact your account executive, send through a credit application. We would assess that, and upon approval of the credit application, you will have the digital access to the funds. So it will be all on our Beyond Banking platform, which is a banking app, and you would be able to draw down the funds as and when you need them. So it's very much very transparent, and with that, um, as you repay, you can draw, draw down again. We structure this specific product over an amortization of 12 to 18 months. So again, it's very flexible in terms of how you would like to structure to support your working capital needs. One of the real benefits that we've seen coming through of the product is that not just in this time, but if you can structure the product according to your annual turnover requirements. So if you've got cash flow restraints, say as most of our, our clients do in January, what you could do upfront is say that every January I'd like to have a payment break and skip that. In terms of this uh, product, we're seeing a large uptake, particularly with our vendors, as well as some of our vendors are actually referring it to their clients. So you can not only look at it for your own business, but if you're speaking to a specific client and you understand that they're needing some sort of cash flow assistance, we can look at positioning this. The next product, which is very much focused at yourselves, which is our suppliers, dealers, vendors, and that is our vendor pre-discounting facility. Now, what the pre-discounting facility is aimed at is supporting you with your cash flow, particularly when you're struggling to get a deal when an asset installed or delivered. 
I'm pretty much sure you guys have got a number of those deals on your books at the moment with lockdown. And how this would work is you, again, would send a credit application through to your account executive. We would put a facility in place. Once we have that facility in place for you, when you have a specific deal that you are struggling to get installed or delivered, you would then provide us with a drawdown form as well as the original rental agreement. Once you've provided us with that, we would then do give, provide you with that payment as per the invoice. Of course, less any internal settlements that may be required. And then in the future, when that rental then does materialize and we are able to activate that rental, what we would then do is we would um, activate the rental and pay the rental amount into your facility to bring down your facility amount. So again, as I say, we are seeing a large uptake of both of these products and a lot of which is seen more so now in these difficult times. These products weren't designed necessarily for COVID, but we are seeing that it would also be a long-term investment strategy and assisting our clients. So please do contact your account executive. And in times like these, it's very important for us to partner and support each other through the growth. So as Linda said, we would love to be getting in our cars and um, having lunch with you. I do say that um, Patrick says he wants some love at the moment because they're feeling fragile, um, but we'll try and do it, give it to you virtually. So if you do have any ideas of other products that you think we should be looking at, we're very happy to do so. And that's it from me. Thanks everybody. In this time, I wish you, your families, your staff, lots of health, wealth and success. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. And um, so basically in a nutshell, revolving loans and, pre and, and local trade finance to pay for your stock. So I'm sure um, right now that we'll be able to assist you. So, so just let us know. And Patrick, we've got lots of love to give. Yes. And I have to quickly, quickly, because I can't talk to you. I don't want to lose because I know people are running out of time. But my children decided to buy me a puppy because they said I'm driving them mad because I'm loving them too much. Um, so they bought me a puppy. So I think at this time, everybody needs love. Um, I'm just quickly, Tony, we, we are running a little bit out of time here. So I'm just going to quickly hand you to Tony because I think you all know we do insurance. But we've decided we know everyone's got a lot of cash flow restraints. So Tony, if you can just keep it very quick um, and just tell them what we're going to do on the insurance. Thanks, Linda. Uh, I think the camera is on. Um, thank you for your time, guys, and thank you for attending. We are just relaunching the insurance offering so that uh, we can add value for uh, the insurance as you require it. But what we're also doing now is we're going to be paying commission to the suppliers when they do an insurance deal with us. Uh, will somebody please just tell me if you can see the screen that I'm sharing with the spreadsheet? We can see the can screen. See it. We can see it. Okay, so here's an example of an insured deal using a, a, a sample of 250,000 Rand on a deal excluding VAT. The monthly uh, premium on that is going to be 373 Rand. And as a supplier, we will pay you on a quarterly basis 380 Rand for that deal, for introducing the insurance to us. The benefit to you is that that uh, cover is in place for the duration of the entire deal. The cover is on a fully comprehensive all risks basis covers fire, lightning, storm, explosion, um, anything that can possibly go wrong with that equipment is all covered. There's a very small excess of 2,000 Rand that's payable in the event of a loss. Um, we use the supplier as the repairer. So the repairs are very quick to authorize and you can get your customer back in business very quickly. We open for insurance business. We open for existing claims. There's been a delay in the reporting of claims over the last while, obviously because of lockdown. 
but that's starting to trickle in and we are settling them pretty quickly. We don't need to do assessments on any claims below 50,000 Rand. Okay. Another good news is talking about what David Shapiro was mentioning earlier about the new technologies. We can also ensure uh, gl uh, green technologies, solar, all of those, but please give us a heads up on it. We can't always use our standard rates. We had an application yesterday for sanitization tunnel being installed outside an office block. That's easy, standard rates, but some of the other stuff isn't. So okay. please just buy in your AE, give me a, a, a shout about new business that you're doing, and we can authorize that cover. I will ask the AEs to send out this uh, fact sheet that uh, I had up on the screen earlier so that you've got it and please get back to me. Okay, thanks Tony. You look Basically. like you're in the hospital. Where are you? <laughs> in the hospital? Yeah, is it just, it's I'm in the, the hospital. <laughs> you are? Yeah, we had to repurpose a bedroom. So okay. it's now an office. Welcome to COVID. <laughs> so those are some of the things we can help. Um, We've also, for those of you who don't know, we released a factor sheet recently to cover 12 and 24 months because we're getting a lot of requests to do thermometers and sanitizer pumps and um, those machines that you walk through and it sprays you. Um, so we A, we can finance that business and B, we know it's probably a, a shorter term offering and um, that's why we've released that factor sheet. We've also released a factor sheet where we will offer a three months deferred rental. Please know it's very different to the payment holiday. The one is a distressed loan to help the client with his cash flow. The other one is saying the client is up to date but in terms of your new business He's obviously worried about his cash flow, wants to get the new equipment, and um, doesn't want to pay for the next three months. So the one's payment holiday, period can't be extended. The other one is new business, three months deferred rental. Um, for some of you, I think we've seen a great success in our DocuSign. If you aren't using DocuSign, please speak to us because it, it, thank goodness for DocuSign. So thank you for that as well, Megan. Is because right now, obviously, to go sign, first of all, you want to protect and keep your staff safe. But second of all, you to get hold of your clients. So it's, it's an electronic document that gets sent directly to your client, either on his laptop or his phone. And what's even more fantastic about it, it comes straight into our system, which enables us to pay out your deals. And right now, like we, we understand that cash flow is king. So the quicker we can pay out your deal, the better. So if you're not using DocuSign, please speak to us and we can help you. We can do that for you. And um, yeah, and now the, I think the big one, I think, let me just see how many people, okay, still got 102. Is, um, and I have had quite a few questions around this is credit. So this, is a world that, like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't even understand how to do credit going forward. Um, it's it's, it's where, where in the past we would look at, at this time of year, we would look at a client's financials for 20, February 2019, and we, we had the ability to make a decision based on that information. Right now, even, February 2020 financials are not going to tell us whether that company can sustain the next six months um, or will can, let alone the next five years. So because we, we, it's the most incredible thing. We have seen clients with very strong balance sheets, but um, they don't have cash flow. And at the end of the day, like I keep saying, cash is king. So, we want the business, we want to get it through. Please don't see us requesting all this additional information as we don't want the business. We are not trying to find reasons to decline your deals. We 
trying to find reasons to do your deals because as much as you want the business, we want the business. So what we're asking for is, can we partner together? And I think your clients at the end of the day will also understand this. And the more information you give us, the more likely we have the ability to approve your deal. I'm staring at this little girl in front of me trying to <laughs> look up. I've got a little toy stuck on the top of my computer. Um, so what we're asking for is their latest audited financials, as up-to-date management accounts as, as you can get. So if you can get March, we, we, in, we in May now, so even if you can get April management accounts um, and bank statements. And you can say, but Linda, we're giving you management accounts, we're giving you financials, why do you need bank statements? Bank statements tell us the affordability on how the client, has the client, can he actually afford to pay his monthly rental? We also have requested, and I, like I said, I know it sounds like a lot, but you've also got to understand we're expecting a huge increase in impairments and bad debt. And we, we need to, and we also at the end of the day, do not want to get clients to get into a debt that they can't afford. So at the same time, we've also got to protect the economy. So bank statements probably is one of the most important things because you can actually create a cash flow from the bank statements. The next thing is we have sent out a COVID-19 form. It doesn't have to be completed from your clients. Because what you can do in conversation, if you're nervous to give it to your client, in conversation, you can say to them, so how has COVID-19 affected your business? Are you an essential service? Um, how's it, it's not only how, you might have a client who, who, who was an essential service for even stage five and stage four, but all their debtors are in lockdown. So you, like how are your clients paying you? How's it affecting you? What are you doing? What are you doing to get your business out of it? Are you reducing salaries? Are you, di are you diversifying on your equipment? Um, so the more, so, so you don't necessarily have to fill in that page. We're not going to insist on it, but we are going to ask the question, especially in deals of excess of 500,000, is what is the impact of COVID-19 on your business and what are you doing about it? So I just appeal to you um, and we're very happy to give some training sessions. We're also very happy to phone your clients and, and chat to them. But I'm appealing to you, don't, please don't think that we're just getting difficult. Because you've got to understand that client sits on our books from three, okay, now 12 months to 16 months. And we need to know, can they, can they actually survive this? Um, we've seen a huge intake on payment holidays. At this point, we've done over 4,600 payment holidays and they're not stopping. They're pouring in every day. So let's, let's uh, feel that we, we work together on this. We talk to each other, we talk to our clients and we, we I promise you, myself and my team and all your account executives are 100% looking at your deals every day. I personally have three credit meetings a day where we try and, and turn around this. But we're asking you to help us because if you come in with a deal and it's got February 2019 financials and no, no um, information on COVID-19 or what industry, because industry is also very important. There's certain industries that are really affected by this terrible disease. And so let's just, just I think we really are quite close to talking to each other regularly. So let's just talk and let's hold each other's hands and just get through this time together. Um, I'm not sure, so it was just, if there's any other questions around credit, or if anybody wants to ask anything of me, otherwise you're welcome to phone me at any time. Linda, we have one other question. Um, yes. Regarding existing clients, will we allow re-signs or restructures where they haven't asked for payment holidays, so thereby extending the period to reduce the instalment? So as long as the client hasn't asked for a payment holiday, 
So we've got very strict, um, we've been handed down very strict rules from the Reserve Bank and from the Banking Association that we cannot profiteer or take, be opportunistic for clients that are in distress. So if a client has asked for a pay, if a client comes and says, I want a payment holiday, and you say, oh, no, I won't give you a payment holiday, but I'm going to give you three months deferred, and I'm going to reduce your rental, we're actually not allowed to do that. If a, you've got to, give your client his payment holiday, and then look at it. For your normal business, because, and it'll probably, you'll probably get a lot of requests for this. So now a client comes to me and says, how can you help me reduce my payment? but he's not asking for a payment holiday. We're very happy to look at doing a re-sign for that business. Um, if you are re-signing the equipment, it depends on how old the, how old the equipment is. So if you're on year four, we, we can't go and do a re-sign for 36 months, but we could do a re-sign, or maybe for 36 months is generally where we like to play, but depending where the equipment is and what equipment is, because can the equipment sustain another three years? Very Again, subject to the latest client's information. And I also appeal to all of you, not that, that we're not going to monitor you on this, but it's the right thing to do is make some money on the deal, but don't rip him off. Don't make, if I've paid you out 100,000 Rand on the first deal, don't come to me for a new deal for the same equipment for 150,000 and tell me you've reduced his payment. Again, we're happy to accommodate it. We're happy that you make, because you've also got a business to run and you've also got bills to pay. And so we, as, as, if, if we can prove that the client is in a better position, because at the end of the day, it's a rental. The client's renting that piece of equipment, so it's the same as a house. Does it matter if it's new or not? But as long as the deal makes sense to you, to me, and to the end user, we're very happy to assist you on that. Oh, my computer says it's going to restart. Is there any other... Um, it's so unusual not being able to talk to all of you. Can't wait to come out of this and throw a coming out party. Are there any other, does anybody have any other questions for me? I would think there would be plenty, or if we just answered them all. There's no okay. questions that I've picked up. I'm just gonna show everyone my little doll that I've got sitting on top of my computer <laughs> to try, because it's so hard talking to a screen. Linda, Hi. there's a message from Brett. Will the quarterly okay. insurance commission be on all new deals um, yes. as of now? Yes. So you would have got you would have got two factor sheets from us. One factor sheet um, excluding insurance and one factor sheet um, including insurance. So for every deal, um, and I know a lot of you have been doing insurance because it makes your payout easier. You aren't disclosing capital to your end user. It's just now we've decided it's, it's time that we get a little bit back to all of you because we understand that you also need cash flow. Okay, we will, uh, we will get to, we'll get it all sent through to you, but a very easy way of doing it, Tony might disagree with me because he's got his formula, is take your including insurance factor, and work out what your payout would be, and then take your excluding insurance factor, and the difference between those two would be the premium, and then you would get 2% of that. Hi, you, Brett, hope you're you keeping well. Um, just one other thing while you all, if you are thinking of questions you're from me, questions is that, um, if any of you, I've, I've done about three for clients, um, is that you, is, is that if you need help with the cash flow, because one thing we, companies often forget about, especially when your cash flow is good, is that you, you don't do your own cash flow. 
So I've designed a, a little cash flow sheet that's it's quite automated where you can put in your sales, you can put in your expenses, you can put in your debtors and how your debtors pay, and you can work out your, and it's very important, is that you can work out your cash flow. So if your sales say, and hopefully not, reduce by 50%, um, what would I need? To, what happens to my cash? And, and do I need an overdraft? Do I need a revolving loan from Sasson? Do I need to apply to my commercial bank for a loan? Um, but but don't don't not do one. I appeal to you because you because you think it's okay, especially the smaller businesses. Um, I, I'm very happy to share it with you, and if I'm even happy if you need help in completing it, I'll ask you for certain information. And it's, it, it should be your Bible. It should be your Bible. Okay, so there's another question here. Is your payment holiday model based on the same criteria for each client? Or do you take the industry into account? If so, certain industries will be impacted for much longer. What industry specific strategy or solutions are you looking at? Okay, so currently, what we're doing is we, we are actually assessing each of the payment holidays as if it was a new deal. Because we, and where the industry comes in, is if the client, for instance, is in the entertainment industry or owns a restaurant, we still will grant him because those are the clients that need payment holidays. So we will still grant him the payment holiday as we would a client who's in an industry where they're able to operate. But how the difference on our side is how do we impairment, impair it? So if it's if it's a, an industry that we believe is still operating and isn't as affected, we will then say this deal is approved as a stage one, which means we feel we're going to get our money back. Then, depending on the risk and the industry, we will then put a different staging. So the industries like your your tourism, your entertainment, your your um, anything anything to your you just think industries. Um, but what we'll do is we'll put them in, into a stage three impairment, which means we have to fully impair those deals. So we grant the payment holiday, so it doesn't really affect your side of the business but it does affect on how I'm impairing those particular deals. So we vet it and it becomes a stage one, stage two or stage three loan. I mean, um, um, restructure. Linda, the other question from uh, Warren is what about finance on software only? Yeah, we can do that. Um, we have a software modus, which we will, I'll, Warren, I'll get, I think, who looks after you, Omohani? I'll get, we'll chat to you separately, but we can, um, we, we've got a separate agreement for software and we just need to see that the license is transferable. Alternatively, we've got a loan structure that we can do software and we would love to do software because I think that's the future. So yes, we can do 100% software. In fact, we, at this point, we're saying, if we can identify an asset, we'll finance it. As long as we can confirm that it's um, a legitimate piece of equipment and it's accredited and we can identify the asset. We can, Patrick. So Linda, just yes. for the benefit yes. of the other people because they can't see the question from Patrick. He's asked, please oh, let us have the rate sheet <laughs> for software as well. Yes. What we'll yeah. do, Patrick, is we can send you a, um, we'll send you the software rate sheet and the software rental agreement. I've got another question here. It says, resigns, do we use upgrade settlement? No, we're going to charge you rental. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> no, you do use, I'd love to charge rental times, period, but um, you do use upgrade settlement. And obviously, just, just on that point, um, your client just has to acknowledge that he's re-signing the equipment for a further 36 months. 
Any other questions for me? You've Linda, got a Janine, Janine asked a question. Um, I'm not sure if if it was answered in the insurance conversation, asking if the insurance commission is only payable if you use the including insurance factor and not when we do the insurance separately on the normal factor. No, the year uh, to use, no, obviously no, going yeah, it's using the with insurance factor because it affects the way we, first of all, it's a much lower rate than it would be otherwise. And secondly, it affects how we do the calculations and the feedback. So yes, it's using the with insurance rate loaded in lease I can see I've got my sun and shirt. <laughs> Is that it? I'm so you I miss you all so much and I'm used to you giving me a hard time. Can you please give me can someone give me a hard time, please? I miss it. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, um, I'm sorry we went over. Um, and I'm very happy to do this again, but we are available for you for, for you. Just give us a call, give your account executive a call. Um, we are, like a, again, reminding you, we're fully operational from home. I'd love to come to Cape Town. How do I get there, Patrick? Patrick says, come to Cape Town. As soon as I can get to Cape Town, I'll be in Cape Town. And I just wish you all to be safe and, and your families and, in, and, and just have, like I look, at, I look at myself every day and I'm in a beautiful home with a big garden. I have two beautiful children. I have my husband. I, I've got food on my table. And I don't think I have to remind any of us for those who, who don't. And that we all just, as South Africans, I know we all a little bit frustrated and a little bit angry and a little bit despondent is can, like Patrick said earlier, can we just love each other through this and do what we can to assist the less fortunate in ourselves? And there's one thing about South Africans is A, we're resilient, but there's a, another thing about us is, and I know a lot of you really well, I've been going on incentives with you for the last 20 years, is that we, we do have a big heart. And if we just continue on that and we don't give up, and we continue just to have faith and just put one foot and, and sometimes just that little bit of love towards someone you don't realize, um, especially those living alone, um, what it, it could actually make such a difference in their lives. So um, I'm just, I know this is a thing, but I'm just sending everyone a big love. Sorry, you can see my puppy here. You can send in everyone a lot of love. And, and hopefully we will all be partying together, um, probably only next year, but um, hopefully we'll be all seeing each other soon. And when Cyril last night on the TV said, no hugging, no kissing, I was like, I might as well stay at home. But um, lovely speaking to you all, and I hope to be seeing you soon.